worship today, Eagle Scout Corps of Honor at 3, Turkey Dinner Benefiting Speak at 5, many opportunities for you to be a disciple of the Lord today. In two weeks, on November 27th, we will have a congregational meeting after worship. That's our customary November congregational meeting, and that again will be November 27th after worship. November 27th is also the first Sunday of Advent, and that means that the day before, on November 26th, we have some work to do. People of all ages are invited and needed to join us from 4 to 6 p.m. on Saturday, November 26th. We'll have a fabulous soup dinner and crafts for the kids as we decorate the church for the holiday season. In your bulletin, you'll find more information about the Parkville Living Center Thanksgiving dinner, about Christmas Eve, and an upcoming Blue Christmas service. But before we anticipate the holiday season, let us appreciate the spirit of the present day as we celebrate this Dedication Sunday together. Please join me in the call to worship. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all its inhabitants stand in awe. Let us praise our mighty God, the one who made all of creation. Let us rise in body or in spirit for hymn number 35. Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty. It is not our job to save the world. It is not our job to reform the church. It is not our job to save our neighbors, our friends, or even ourselves. God does all these things. When we think the word is ours to do, we become anxious about our shortcomings and worried about what is left undone. But the work is not ours. It is God's. As we learn to lean in and trust the Lord, we find ourselves empowered to do what we can and to be a part of the good work God is already doing. When we see the Lord, our tasks and ourselves in perspective, there is peace. And for the times when we fail to see, we confess. First using the prayer printed in our bulletins and then in a holy moment of quiet prayer, let us pray. Lord, we come before you broken and tired, weak and weary. 
knowing we have fallen short and come up empty. You come among us as our rock and our provider, but we spurn the gifts you give us and take your presence for granted. Instead of leaning on your strength, we try to do it all for ourselves. Instead of seeking your provision, we give up hope for the future. Lord, we are tired of rebellion and weary from leaning on our own strength. Forgive our sins, revive our lives, help us to seek your energy and find your peace. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now as forgiven children of God at peace with ourselves and with others and with God, let us exchange signs of peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you.
at this time, at this time, we invite our young disciples to come forward for a time that's just for them. Good morning, everyone. It's very good to see you. Malcolm and Esme, I'm going to keep, I need you to keep your hands to yourself while you're up here. <laughs> that, that includes adipose, too. He, he wants to sit on my lap. OK, that's fine. And baby does as well. OK. Her name's Claire. Claire, that's right. Welcome. It's really good to see you all this morning. I, uh, you got to hold that till later. So I want to tell you all about the scripture reading that we're going to have in worship today. And it's a scripture reading that has a vision in it of what the world could be like. And in fact, we believe it's what the world will be like when God's totally finished with it and when everything is the way God wants it to be. In that vision, there is no fighting. There's no one who tries to hurt anybody else. There's no dying. Everybody gets to live forever with God. And everybody gets more than enough of everything they need. So everybody has enough to eat, enough to drink, enough of everything. Malcolm, you had a question? OK, firstly, I'm confused. If people never die, then the world just going to get crowded and crowded and crowded. So Malcolm says, if, if people never die, the world just is going to get more and more crowded. Well, part of, part, of why, part of why I have you all sit like this, to answer your second question, is because there's cameras back there that are broadcasting for the online service. And the people who watch online like to see the kids' faces. Okay. So that's part of why we sit like this. So why don't you sit like that? Well, because then I would have my back to the camera, and, and that would look kind of weird. So fair enough. But as for, like, in that perfect world that God is going to make for us, you know, would people just, would there just be more and more people and not enough room on the planet? Well, no. Well, so I think first of all, I think in that new world, um, there's not necessarily gonna be more people. I think there's just gonna be the people who have already lived um, and who get to live that transformed life with God. But I think that even if there are more people, I think God would have a way to make it so that the world keeps expanding and everybody still has more than enough. Because God is all powerful and God can do stuff like that. Well, they can't expand it too much because, well, then the world's just gonna go out of balance. Well, we, we can think about that some more when we're at home. But what I wanted to tell you all today is that that's the kind of world that God wants us to live in. That's the kind of world that God wants, um, that God wants to make for us. But it's also something that God holds out as a vision for us so that we have a sense of how to live the way God wants us to live. So if, hey, Malcolm, I need you to be quiet now. I love you, buddy. But this is my time, all right? I love you. And Esme, you got to sit down. I love how comfortable you are in the church, but you got to sit down like the rest of the other kids. I love you too, I love you too. All right, so God holds out this vision of this perfect world. And it's not just like a vision of, oh, oh, that could happen someday. It's a vision of what God wants us to do. So if we know that in God's perfect world, there's no fighting and there's no people hurting each other, what should we do? Not fight or hurt each other? What if we see somebody else hurting somebody else? We step in and try to help. What if we see people who don't have enough? In God's perfect world, everybody has more than enough. We give them some of what we have. Exactly. Right. In God's perfect world, you know, everybody already has what they need, but we're not there yet. So we've got to try to help people to have what they need. 
And so that perfect world is a vision for us of not just what God's going to do for us later, but also what we can do today to help make that world come into being, to help partner with God, to help make that world come into being. Let's say a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks for showing us your way. We pray that you watch over us and help us to follow you. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. Through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, God shows us a time when national boundaries are no more. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) sorry.
Please forgive me. I was just so anxious for you all to hear the word. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. Through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, God shows us a time when national boundaries are no more, when people will no longer be in conflict with one another, when everyone will have everything they need and death itself will pass away. This is a reality that God will accomplish and a vision for us to strive for as we do our work in ministry. This is Isaiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. Listen for the word of the Lord. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with a shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, a rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Scott Cormode is a professor of leadership development at Fuller Theological Seminary in California and the author of the book, The Innovative Church, How Leaders and Their Congregations Can Adapt in an Ever-Changing World. I'll tell you more about Professor Cormode in a moment. For now, I want to remind you that the challenges facing the church in the modern day have been a constant thread through this worship series. We began on October 16th by talking about national trends of decreased church attendance, decreased giving, and changes in how people think about both institutional commitments and institutional religion. We also talked about how these trends have played out in our particular time and place, and some of the personalities who were part of our story of wrestling with these issues. In subsequent sermons, we dug into the past of the church, but always with an undertone of, look at what the people of the past did. Look at the challenges that they faced. They're no better or no worse than you or me, and yet look at what they've accomplished. They are energized by the same Holy Spirit that we are. They are guided by the same God that we are. If they could overcome the barriers of the past and achieve profound things in partnership with God, so can we. In the present time, as we face the same strong national headwinds that many other churches are facing, and as we prepare for a pastoral transition, we are inspired by the Holy Spirit and energized for the work ahead. Because there is a plethora of profound activity centered around this place, and today is a day to celebrate what God is doing with us here and now. 
later in this sermon, I'm going to ask you to tell me your view of how the Holy Spirit is moving and what God is doing in this place. But for now, I want to introduce that conversation a bit more. There are many churches around the country who have bucked these national headwinds and managed to grow in the face of long odds. And the most interesting thing connecting them is that they don't have much in common. Now, don't get me wrong. They worship the same God we do, and we hold in common the same scripture and the same Holy Spirit, but their paths to transformation have all been different. For Disciples of Christ Church in Indiana, it was a dedicated prayer program. Prayer teams offering up prayers during leadership meetings, Sunday school classes, and worship series. This ministry of prayer energized the church, opened people's eyes to see the movement of the Holy Spirit, and transformed their congregation. For a Lutheran church in Minnesota, a new outreach ministry of home repairs for needy people in their neighborhood led to new members and financial gifts to the church from people in the wider community. In other churches, it's small groups that lead to positive change. In still others, it's radical, life-changing hospitality for people in the neighborhood. Professor Scott Cormode, who I mentioned earlier, tells a story about an Anglican church in Florida where a middle school youth group studied the Psalms of Lament. Lament connects deeply with middle schoolers who are going through all the struggles of adolescence. But the remarkable thing here is that when they heard about it, their parents wanted in on these psalms of lament. Their parents wanted to know more about these practices of lament. The parents were largely not members of the congregation, but they wanted to learn about these psalms. And then from there, the whole church wanted to be a part of it. So the rector of the church made it a Lenten focus during worship with the middle schoolers leading the services and a whole new dose of youthful energy came into the church. These are the kinds of transformations that can happen in congregations. This is the work that the Holy Spirit can do. And again, we'll talk in a couple minutes about what the Spirit is doing right here, right now in our midst. But first, I want to relay an interesting story from Professor Scott Cormode. He tells a story about innovation. It involves his grandmother's house in California, which was a tiny house, not much bigger than this chancel up here. But there was a giant redwood tree in the backyard. In the 1920s, a former resident of the house visited the sequoias and took a single sapling, just a little sapling of a redwood tree, back to that backyard. And this former resident planted that little sapling, and he nurtured it and watered it. For many years, the little tree struggled, but eventually, it hit the water table and then the growth really took off. And today it's this giant redwood tree in the backyard of a small house. Professor Cormode says that this story represents a lot of common myths about innovation. We tend to think of innovators as lone people who have this one brilliant idea, just one. And then they spend years nurturing that idea until finally their efforts pay off and the big idea grows and grows. But that's not really how innovation works. True innovation happens through teamwork, not through lone inventors. And it generally doesn't happen through one great idea that gets all of our attention, but through, to quote Professor Cormode, 19 mediocre ideas. He says that 19 mediocre ideas are better than one brilliant idea. Because if you really want a giant redwood tree to grow, you'd be better off with 19 saplings than one. You'd be better off planting a lot of seeds and trying to nurture all of them. Because if you do it that way, you increase your chance of finding the one that really takes off. So according to this esteemed professor, the way forward for churches is to nurture a spirit of experimentation. Because we don't know what idea is going to work for us. If we embrace the spirit of experimentation, we liberate ourselves to try new things. Some of those new things will work and some of them won't. Some of them will connect with our community and some of them will not. 
for the ones that don't connect with people the way we hope they will, we can learn from those experiments and we can try again in different ways. And for the ones that do tap into something holy and profound and meaningful, for the ones that do reach people and demonstrate the potential to do more, we can nurture those experiments and see what they grow into. At Parkville Presbyterian Church, what will the transformative activity be for us? What will be our small groups, our prayer teams, our outreach ministry, our evangelism program? What will be the thing that the Holy Spirit uses to transform us and the world around us? And could it be something that we've found already? In our scripture reading this morning, we heard about a new world. We heard about a new world God will make where the strong will give up their aggression, where peace will be the way of the land, where death will be extinguished by God, and where all people will have more than enough of the good things they need. This is a vision of the end of time, when God will do what only God can do to wholly and completely transform the world. But while we wait for that divine transformation, while we wait for that divine transformation of the whole world, there are churches. Churches where God can do what people can do. When those people dance in concert with God and live in partnership with the Holy Spirit. The vision of our scripture reading is a vision of the kind of world God wants for us. A world of harmony, peace, and love. And only God can bring that vision in all its fullness to life. But we can hold it up as an ideal. We can think of it as something to strive for. As we work together to bring more and more of God's vision into reality through ministries of peace and love in God's church. To conclude this sermon today, I want to hear from you. Where is God at work today through Parkville Presbyterian Church? What is happening in and through this space and these people? Tell me about the work of the Holy Spirit and the vision of God coming to life. I can tell you lots of things that I think about in response to those questions, but I wonder what you think about. Jane. Mm -hmm. Jane came to this church in recent years, maybe about four years ago, possibly. Okay. And she says she came because of the Speak Food Pantry and because she knew that we were hosting homeless people in the church building and that we had that kind of commitment to serving people in our world. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's definitely moving through that. Randy? The Parkville Living Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so through the Parkville Living Center, We've seen lots of experiments come to life of these monthly break times, um, you know, the Thanksgiving dinner that was put on last year and we're going to do again this year. I was thinking earlier today about this lovely symbiosis of we had a trunk or treat here at the church a couple weeks ago. And there was this combination of, you know, lots of church volunteers were here with their trunks, you know, open with their trunks, ready for the kids to come. Inside the building was Parkville Living Center activities of crafts for the kids and snacks and kind of a place to sit down. And also most of the marketing for the event was done through the Parkville Living Center. And so there is this lovely symbiosis of, you know, the church provides the people that help to kind of staff this activity and make it what it is. But also the Living Center provides these resources that make it much more expansive and community oriented. Than, than we might have been able to do just on our own as a church. And so there's this lovely synergy that's happening there. Very much the Holy Spirit at work. Yes, yeah, Susan. I'd like to further the living center in 
Yeah, Susan. F election event, there was a lady volunteer hmm. who came, who's not a member here, but yeah. came and volunteered because she came to the church. Hmm. Susan wants to lift up the Parkville Living Center's Tech Connect, where people can come and get free lessons about how to use their computers or other technology. During the election, most recently, we had the election hospitality table, and Susan noticed a volunteer who had come to the Living Center for Tech Connect, but who also helped to staff that, that hospitality table, which is really neat. All right, where else do you see the Holy Spirit at work? Linda. So Linda lifts up the interconnectedness of some of our mission activities, Hillcrest, Fuller Center, Care Portal, the Speak Food Pantry, and she notes a particular recent event of a Fuller Center uh, client bringing people to the food pantry because she knew that they needed that service. And just the interconnectedness of all those mission activities is very powerful, very much the Holy Spirit at work. Mary? Yeah. Yeah, the dedication of our Sunday school teachers being there week in and week out, things like the Christmas program that get the kids up in front and worship learning about you know what it is that we do together and learning how to be leaders in the church all of that is very much the holy spirit at work uh yes marcia hmm hmm yeah yeah yeah, so there's the mission team that does its work, but also the way it leads the congregation into being able to all of us participate together in some really great work that's being done in our community. It's beautiful. Okay, Jan. Amen. So yeah, people in the community give that affirmation of the election hospitality table as a thing that is warm and inviting and lets them know that there's something holy that's happening. Okay. Wayne? Yeah. Yeah, those dedicated folks who, who help to maintain the church building, who help to keep up the grounds, mow the lawn, clear the gutters. Um, you might have noticed in the narthex recently, two, um, two of the church's stained glass windows that had been um, at the, okay, someone tell me cardinal directions. What's that way? South, at the south entrance and the east entrance? Yes at the south entrance and the east entrance are now hung up in the narthex. And that was the dedicated work of a few people who repainted that wall and 
brought those windows up there and re-hung re them to hung, hang in a place where they could get more visibility. It's just as a reminder of the church's past. And that's just one of the few things that our buildings and ground teams does to help make the church a beautiful and holy place. Joyce? Yeah. Every day of the week, those dedicated people who deliver meals on wheels and those connections mean so much to the people who receive those meals. Um, anybody back here want to say music? <laughs> All right. Our music program is beautiful and very much a place where the Holy Spirit's at work. Okay. Others? There's so many opportunities for engagement. We're still looking for new ways to connect with our congregation here and to reach out to our community beyond these walls. Absolutely. Good. I'd love to sit here and, and go through this more, but um, I don't want to you know, keep you all from watching the Chiefs-Jaguars game later today. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I do want to lift up all of the ways that the Holy Spirit is already moving here, all of the things that we are already doing that are fantastic and powerful and profound. We all get to participate in these things together through our volunteer hours, through our funding of the church, through all of the ways that we are here and being a part of things, we all get to do what the Holy Spirit is doing to help this be a place where that vision that God has for the future world, where we see a glimpse of it. We see a glimpse of that love, peace, and harmony through all this beautiful mission work and work with kids and outreach work, all that we do together. We see a glimpse of the world God is making and we all get to participate in it together. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit for our responsive hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
as we bear our mutual burdens and celebrate our mutual joys, we come to this time of prayer where we lift up joys and concerns to God. What do we have to lift up today? Yes, Jan. Prayers of joy for Linda Tillinghast and her recovery. Praise be to God for that. We also pray for Jen, her daughter-in-law, as she prepares for a similar surgery in the next month. We pray that God will be with her during that time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I got a call yesterday from Bill Walter, who told me that EJ had had a fall um, about a week ago, about a week and a half ago, at her sister's home in St. Joseph. She was taken by ambulance to Mosaic, Mosaic Medical Center up in St. Joe, where she received initial care. And right now she's home, and she's, uh, as he was talking to me on the phone yesterday, she was up and dusting, so she's apparently doing well. But uh, she has a bruise on her face that's taking some time to, to heal. So we pray for her in that continued recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others we wish to lift up today? Linda. Yeah. We pray for Preston, a 29-year-old young man who's a resident of our Hillcrest apartment. We pray for him and his continued journey toward independence. Uh, we are adopting him for Christmas, and so the angel tree has been set up out there and is ready for us to take gifts for Preston and to be a part of helping make Christmas for him. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayers. Uh, yes, Linda? Yeah. We pray for Kathy Plack on the passing of her mother. We pray for her and for her sisters and their grief. We pray that God will watch over all of them. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Yes, Marco? Uh, prayers for Dylan, a Park Hill South, South High School student who was injured Friday night and was taken to a hospital. We pray for him and his recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Kelly? For Melissa Jones, who is in Cleveland caring for her mother this weekend, we pray for her mother's we pray for her mother's sense of peace during what may be the final chapter of her life. We pray for Melissa, who's seeing this happen largely from afar and, and looking for ways to care for her mother. We pray for all people in the complicated mix of trying to care for care for people where distance and time are a struggle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Herb. Yeah. We pray for Roger Perdue, who is in hospice care. Um, his daughter, Lori, is a Fuller Center House um, repair recipient, as well as someone who sat on the board of the Fuller Center. So this is a family that's very much a friend of the Fuller Center with the father in hospice. We want to pray for everyone involved in that situation, for God's peace and comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Henry. We, yeah, we pray for Henry's grandpa, Jack, for a speedy recovery for his foot, for his strength to be restored. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayers. Okay. Are there others? Okay. Let us continue in prayer. God, we give you thanks for the gifts you give. We pray that you will watch over us as we strive to lit, walk in your way and to be your people. We recognize that there are many situations that we see that are hard, many situations where people are in need of healing. We pray that where we can be a part of that healing, that you will empower us so that we can be there, so that we can be a comfort, so that we can be a symbol of your love. We pray that where there is healing that only you can make possible, that you will intervene and that you will work with people to heal wounds that are visible and invisible, to heal scars that are spoken and unspoken. Lord, we pray all this in your son's name, praying the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to this table of communion, this place where the ties that bind us together are renewed each week. At the communion table, we are bonded together with people in every time and place who have come to tables like this one and who have met Jesus Christ at a place like this one. We believe that when we meet Jesus Christ here in this moment, that we are not only bonded to him, but we are bonded to all others who are connected to him. That we are then part of this global body of Christ that spans time and place, that connects us with people that indeed represents the ties that bind us together. When Jesus was having supper with his closest friends, there was a moment in that meal where he lifted up a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Each time you share bread together, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup and poured it out. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in the substance of my life. As often as you share this cup together, remember me. I'll invite the servers to come forward at this time. And as the servers come forward, I'll offer us a reminder that at this table, we feel the Holy Spirit at work among us. At this table, we connect with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, who transforms these basic elements into something more than what they obviously are, something more than what they seem at first glance. At this table, what we have here is a real representation of Jesus Christ among us through the Spirit who makes it so. That same Spirit inspires us and energizes us and empowers the ministries of the church. And so as we come forward, we know that the Spirit that makes Jesus Christ present here is also present with us when we leave here and empowers all the ways in which we live as the hands and feet of Christ. Let us come forward.
Parkville Presbyterian Church is built on the legacy of people like you and me. In the past, our church has done heroic things. In the frontier days, we survived without a building, came back from the brink of death more than once, and still went on to great accomplishments. In former times, the saints of our church founded a college, started a flourishing community center, and ministered to the swamp angels who lived near the river as just one part of a thriving outreach ministry. When we look back, their legacy may seem imposing to us, but it need not be so. We are made in the same image of God, and we are composed of the same basic elements. Future generations will look back on us and marvel at our accomplishments, how we maintained this building for 70 years and counting, longer than any other place the church is called home, how we serve all people and never turn away anyone, even if their needs are extraordinary, how we have continued the community center legacy. We too are saints, just like they were, and we too are building the legacy of Parkville Presbyterian Church. You can be a part of that legacy through a gift in the offering plate, a pledge card with planned gifts for 2023, or a gift through one of the other means listed in your bulletin. However we give and whatever we give, may all our gifts be used by God to build the kingdom of heaven. but hum or sing along, well, that's okay. He's got the whole Let's say a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks for these, your gifts, recognizing that you give us great gifts each day, recognizing that we are blessed beyond measure with more than enough of the good things we need. We pray that you will inspire in us a spirit of offering ourselves, offering our time, 
offering our love, offering our energy, offering the whole of who we are, offering our resources, offering the things by which we compose our identity, offering those things to the service of others and to your worship. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will accept these offerings, that these offerings and these pledges will be a tool by which you build your kingdom, a tool by which that world that is coming into being will come. We pray that you will use these gifts and use us, use all that we give you each and every day to help make your vision for the world reality. Amen. Let us sing our final hymn. Rise up, church. Amen.